In 2018, there was a horrific attack on six cyclists on a dusty road in the country of Tajikistan. Cycling separately for months on end, the paths of three couples eventually converged in Central Asia. The night before that fateful day, they all sat around relaxing, laughing, and enjoying each other's company. The next day's ride was going to be challenging, so they all had a bit of anticipation and excitement about it. It turned out to be the last day for four of those cyclists. So this is going to be a longer detailed story about the lives of these cyclists and I'm going to focus on what they accomplished in their adventures and as much as I could find anyways. Some had more information out there than others. I'm going to look at who they were as people, how they got into cycling and where they traveled before that fateful day. I'm not going to focus on the attack itself. I'll share what happened at the very end, but it's going to be brief and it's not the focus of this video. What I am going to focus on is the incredible adventures that they all had before this day. And I also wanted to warn those of you who might not be up to hearing that kind of story today. I know in the comments a lot of you say that you really love the stories that have happy endings and I just want you to know now that this is not one of them. But that said, there's a lot that I go over about each of their journeys before this attack. So I encourage you to stick around and watch the part about their adventures because they all had some really incredible adventures. The ending is tragic, but what they all accomplished in their lives is more important and worth celebrating and sharing. So cycling. People navigate almost every corner of the world by bike because it's relatively cheap. It's a super easy way to get around if you know a little bit of bike maintenance. And it's slow, but it also affords you better connection with the world around you. You meet way more people on a bike than you would in a car. You're closer to the animals, the plants, the smells, everything nature-y around you. But that also opens you up to a few more risks than traveling in a car. But those who do those long bike tours say it's totally worth it. And it's very satisfying because you have to earn every mile. You're riding, you're pedaling, your body is powering you down that road. And you become super intertwined with the road. It becomes your life and all you care about. And cyclists who do it say that you'll remember every section of that road forever. So there's a few significant locations that I'm going to talk about right now just to kind of make you all familiar with them when they come up later. So the first is Tajikistan. It's located in Central Asia and it's the heart of the famous Silk Road, which I'll be talking about in a bit. It has a population of 9.75 million and it's home to many mountains and rivers. In fact, 90% of the country is mountainous with 50% of the country having an elevation of more than 3,000 meters or almost 10,000 feet above sea level. And the Silk Road, well, that's a popular destination for cyclists. It's 13,000 kilometers, around 8,000 miles, and it takes most cyclists around four to five months to complete. It goes from Beijing to Istanbul. And it goes through a ton of countries. It goes through China, Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Turkey. So all the stands and more. It's one of the world's longest, hardest, hottest, and coldest cycling challenges so it really has it all. And those who have done it say that the rewards are totally worth it. There's the natural beauty, the people are wonderful, and there's this unique architecture all across the land that makes it all worthwhile. And the Silk Road, it was one of the most important trade networks in the world. It connected the east to the west, and it facilitated trade, most notably of silk, which is what it's named after. And the route contributed to cultural, political exchange and promoted the development of Asia and the European civilizations for more than 1,500 years. It's known as the first global trade route in history. And today, some people cycle the whole route while others do different sections. There's the Great Wall Stretch, the Persian Silk Road, or the Pamir Highway route. The Pamir Highway is also called the Roof of the World as it climbs to elevations of more than 4,500 meters or 15,000 feet. And it's the second highest highway in the world and one of the world's most scenic mountain highways. It's actually positioned along the northern route of the Silk Road and there's these huge valleys, high mountain ranges. It's vast and breathtaking, so adventure cyclists really consider it a legendary itinerary. And since the highway, it was built mostly in the 1930s by the Soviet Union, it really hasn't received significant maintenance since then, so it's a pretty rough road. 
It's heavily damaged in places by erosion and earthquakes, avalanches, there's long stretches of tarmac, gravel, sand, and rocks. It's a super dry and rugged area, and there's gravel climbs for the cyclists that just go on for days. They go on so high that people get altitude sickness, which is insane. And that's why some cyclists call it the road from hell. So in this story, there's three couples, one from the US, one from Switzerland, and Renee Woke and Kim Posma from the Netherlands. Kim and Renee kind of lived an interesting life. They actually lived on a houseboat in Amsterdam. Renee was a 56-year-old psychologist, and Kim was 58 and a hospital administrator. They were foster parents for many troubled children. They'd take them into their houseboat until the children were able to find permanent homes. And they fostered 15 kids and wrote a book about the 10 years they were foster parents to children in crisis. They wanted to put their experiences on paper in the hope of inspiring others because they said, there's just too many children in need and too few foster parents. The book was actually heading to the printer when they were on the road, so they had to take some time to work on it while they were on their cycling tour. And while they both did their share of traveling throughout the years, Rene had actually been to over 130 countries. He was a really experienced traveler. And in February of 2018, they set off to cycle from Thailand to Iran. They planned to arrive in Iran by September before flying back to the Netherlands. And like many cyclists do on that route, they decided to go through Tajikistan to avoid going through Afghanistan, which they decided was just too dangerous to travel through. The first stage had them kind of meandering through these nice roads with traditional villages. There was wooden houses on stilts. They ended up riding through the jungle and for the first time they saw gibbons in the wild. They'd never seen them before, so they were super excited. Kim and Renee were really interested in local culture too, especially Kim who graduated as an anthropologist. And while in Hanoi, Vietnam, they found themselves intrigued by this Bia Hoi culture. It's the first time I'd heard of it, so I looked into it and I found it really interesting as well. Bia Hoi literally translates to fresh beer. And Bia Hoi is not just a drink, it's a way of life, and it embodies the beer culture of the country. It's a common sight to see the Vietnamese in the many street corners consuming a cold beer at dusk. And it's a beer that's made daily, so it doesn't really have any preservatives in it, and it has to be consumed within 24 hours or it goes bad, so it's always really fresh. And at the end of the day, they end up dumping the extra down the gutters, which is just a tragedy in itself. As I was looking at Kim and Renee's blog, there was this common theme about beer. They were super into finding like beers all over the place and in different countries and comparing the taste and cost. So it was just kind of a thing they did. So stumbling upon this Biahoy culture was probably pretty exciting for them. And it was during this leg of the trip that they saw their first camels. Renee was so excited and said, those were the first camels of our journey. Before that, we had a first moment with yaks, and before that with gibbons. So they were just seeing all the animals all the time. So then they cycled across this vast section of China. They visited panda sanctuaries. They stayed in a hotel with an electric blanket in Tibet, which they were super excited about because they were freezing. Then one night, they had a scary moment when a dog started sniffing and growling at them while they were in their tent one night. They had stopped to camp in this beautiful idyllic spot and thought it was just a perfect spot, nice and peaceful. Then they settled into their tent for the night and they heard this dog barking on the distance. Then it started coming closer and started running circles around their tent. And they found if they moved, it got aggressive with them and started growling and attacking the tent. But eventually they were just able to stay still and get some sleep and the dog went off. But the next morning, off in the distance, they saw this huge Tibetan Mastiff, and that's what it was. It's a dog notorious for their aggression towards strangers, so they were lucky that it left them alone. In another section, they took a bus to bypass this 1,700-kilometer, or about 1,000-mile section in China, where they had heard that there were tensions between the local people and the government. So you get the idea that people really had to pay attention to the road and the word on the street about what the local political situations were like in every area that they passed through. So Kim and Renee finally made it to Tajikistan into the Pamir Mountains. Now keep in mind the Pamir Mountains, they're located at a junction with another notable mountain range called the Himalayas. You may have heard of them and that big old beast called Mount Everest. There was nervous excitement as this journey led south over this massive pass over 4,500 meters, 15,000 feet. And now altitude sickness, that can start as low as 3,000 meters if somebody's ascending rapidly. 
People can get headaches, nausea, exhaustion, and on top of the lack of oxygen, they'd also be facing cold, hail, snow, and a really nasty road surface. So doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> I swear adventure people just love to torture themselves. So Kim and Renee, they were actually so cold in their tent one night that they just had to huddle together to preserve their body heat. Other cyclists who were riding the area were also affected by the altitude, and most of them took pills for the altitude sickness. Two days later, they were over that pass, and Kim and Renee found this new environment just spectacular. It was vast, these huge wide valleys, and the colors they said were amazing, that they saw 50 shades of brown that they'd never seen before or didn't even know existed. After the high passes of the Pamirs, they arrived in the Wakhan Valley. On one side of the Panj River is Afghanistan, the other side is Tajikistan. Kim and Renee said that Afghanistan is literally a stone's throw away. And this is where they met up with the other two couples in this story. The talk of the day was always the condition of the road surface between cyclists, because that's really all they cared about. The roads were so bad that they found themselves asking why they were even there. But then they just accepted it because they said suffering is part of it and it will pass. Kim and Renee also said that I never knew there were so many ways to make cycling impossible for you. So they were really feeling the challenge on this trip. They were also having a great time. On the last night, Kim and Renee, they found this shop with beer and Georgian wine and were super excited about that because they got to try some more beer. <laughs> and they were very happy and said it was just a really pleasant evening. They said on their blog, tomorrow will continue towards the capital of Dushanbe. As they headed towards the next section, Renee described it as high, heavy, inhospitable, and long. He said this will be the ultimate challenge of our trip. Marie-Claire Dumand and Marcus Hummel were Swiss cyclists from Zurich. He was 62 and she was 59 and they wrote a blog called A Dream Comes True. Marcus was retired but he studied electronic engineering and he worked in finance for a lot of years. He was an enthusiastic sailor, he was super into motorcycles and was a great cook who just loved eating. Marie-Claire, she was a teacher and she worked in HR for many years. She was determined, loved challenges, and she was really enthusiastic about bike riding, cycling. She loved traveling and had been traveling since she was a teenager. She's just been all over the world. Their cycling actually started 20 years before this trip when they spent a year and a half traveling around the world and then spent three months biking through Venezuela. They say they love the unique experience as it brought them closer to nature and in closer contact with local people in remote areas. They found that people would never stop for a car or a bus, but they would for bikes. So decades later, they both started dreaming about another cycling trip and the Silk Road seemed to be a perfect fit for them. They were interested in its history, the fact that it went through many different countries and cultures and that it had these fascinating landscapes that they had never seen before. So Marcus ended up retiring and Marie Claire took a sabbatical from work. In early 2017, they spent seven months cycling through 14 different countries and they reached the Chinese border after cycling over 10,000 kilometers or 6,200 miles. They had a blast and they returned home and reflected on the how they had such a good time and not long after they finished that trip, they were ready to go again. They said the dream is not over yet. We're missing the Chinese part of the Silk Road and we definitely do not want to miss that section. And so, six months later in April 2018, they left Switzerland to fly to China. From there, the plan was to bike to Kyrgyzstan and since they were already on the road, they didn't want to miss that famous Pamir Highway. Like I said earlier, it's one of those coveted trips for cyclists and they all want to hit it. So they got to the Pamir and they started off and described it as a dreamlike valley with an infinitely wide plateau, lush green grasses and grazing cows just opening up in front of us. It looks like a picture book. Their last blog post had them leaving for Urkeshtum, a border crossing between Kyrgyzstan and China. Here they met up with Jay and Lauren who were from the US. It was the first time Marie Claire and Marcus were on the road with other cyclists so they really enjoyed having some company. And they seem to really hit it off with Jay and Lauren. They said, the ride is entertaining. We talk, take a break, simply cycle. All four of us just enjoying the silence and the dreamlike landscape. 
And in this area, they ran into a lot of other cyclists because this is a really popular time of year to do this highway as a cyclist. So they'd all stop and chat, exchange their road stories, and they said it's just like a big family. And then the foursome met up with Kim and Renee. They were having a great time, the six of them all together. And one morning, Renee surprised everybody with real Italian espresso. And this was a huge treat for them because they were probably subsisting on, you know, nabob ground coffee or cowboy coffee with grounds at the bottom or no coffee at all. Marie Claire said, we haven't had such good coffee for a long time. Their last entry was on July 25th when the group cycled together to the town of Korog on the Tajikistan-Afghanistan border. They stayed at the hotel and enjoyed the comforts of a bed, good food, cozy sitting areas, and an Indian restaurant nearby, which was a big treat. Right next to the hotel was a park with a restaurant, and right by the river is where they sat for the evening. Marie Claire said, you can spend an afternoon here with tea or beer. It's almost like holidays. Jay Austin and Lauren Gagan were from Washington, D.C. They kept a prolific blog during their travel, so I have a lot more information on them than I do on the others. And I highly encourage you to check it out because Jay's writing, he did most of the writing on the blog. It was just really entertaining and fantastic to read. And Jay's writing just kept you hanging. He had an uncanny ability to kind of just leave you hanging at the end of each blog post before the next one because they just had so much interesting stuff going on. So Jay, as a kid, he was always interested in exploring the world and he actually wanted to become an astronaut. In 2012, at the age of 23, he built a tiny home to reduce his carbon footprint and eliminate his monthly housing costs. And in doing that, he was able to save up all this extra cash, which he used to go on a series of adventures. He drove his motor scooter across the US, he backpacked through Europe, he spent a month in India, and he cycled solo through Morocco. And then he met Lauren. Lauren excelled in school and she was a deep thinker with an empathetic nature. Her roommate in university said Lauren was the one that everybody was drawn to. She made you feel like you were the only person in the room. And now Lauren was a bit reluctant to give cycling a try when she met Jay because she hadn't really done a whole lot of it before that. But Jay was really into it and she started commuting to and from work and then just fell in love with cycling. So, like many adventurous people do, they're, they start out with these small adventures. They just did an afternoon bike tour here and there. But soon, like happens to many people, their ambitions increased. And they wanted to go somewhere big, do a big bike tour. In 2016, they went on their first long cycling tour in Iceland. And they spent a month touring around the country. When they got back, they wanted something bigger, and that's another common theme amongst adventurers is you gotta ramp it up. You gotta go on a bigger, more extreme, or more remote adventure. And that's when they decided to quit their jobs and cycle around the world. Now they had these pretty comfortable jobs. They were stable, full-time jobs, but they just wanted something different in life. As Jay said on his blog, they were giving up comfort for way more uncertainty, way more discomfort, and we hope way more fun. They wanted to see the world and thought that biking, well, that was a great way to do it. And it was going to be kind of at a relaxing pace. They didn't have a set itinerary. They didn't have like a hard time frame that they needed to follow. They just knew that they were going to be on the road for probably two to three years. And they were just going to kind of wing it as they went along. So they had a rough idea of where they were going to go. They were going to start at the southern tip of Africa, head north, up through Africa, go into Europe, east into Central Asia and Southeast Asia, fly over to South America, cycle all the way back up to the US and back home. And of course, a lot of people asked them why they were doing this crazy long and remote and possibly dangerous trip. And their answer, well, it was, we like travel and each other a whole lot. And we want to do a lot more of it together. We're young and healthy and we won't always be, so it just seems like a good time. They said, on bikes we learn to appreciate every hill and its eventual descent, to really take in every town or village we pass, no matter how small, to really stop and talk to people and not blow by them at 80 miles an hour. On bikes, a mountain pass is an accomplishment. It's pretty easy to feel really good about yourself and what you've done at the end of each day. 
They talk about emotions and how they were feeling about six months before the trip because they were making these final preparations to these huge changes in their lives. Jay said, I think Lauren is feeling a little nervous and I'm feeling maybe equal parts nervous, mostly about wild animals, and excited, mostly about everything else. It's scary and daunting, but it's also really thrilling. And Jay wrote a blog post titled 10 Pre-Trip Worries. He said there's excitement and anticipation, but mixed in is anxiety like I've never felt before. Fear that leaves me doubting the very pretense of this whole trip altogether. My brain grants that, all things considered, it's actually not as reckless as an idea as it sounds, and things are more likely than not to turn out totally okay. But my gut isn't convinced. It still twists and turns at the suggestion. Makes me feel queasy at times. Fills my stomach with butterflies and pits and worries. But he chalked these feelings to being the normal pre-trip jitter feelings that he'd had before, because he'd had them on other trips. They were maybe a little bit more intense because of the length of the trip that they were going on and just the sacrifices they were making to do it. And there were other concerns. He was worried about it being boring, uncomfortable. They worried about going over budget and just basically feeling unproductive and self-indulgent because he was aware that it was kind of a self-indulgent thing to do. And lastly, perhaps, he said, the greatest fear is the most immediate and most physical. Over the tens of thousands of kilometers we're likely to travel, it only takes one mistake. A hungry animal, a wild dog, a distracted driver, an angry individual, or a slippery patch of ice for this grand adventure to become a great disaster, one with painfully intimate consequences. He was really worried about something happening to Lauren that he couldn't control. And he said it wasn't just a worry, it was a terrifying fear that outweighed all the preceding doubts and dread put together. But in the end, he said, these are not reasons to avoid adventure. Risk is the singular inherent quality in adventure. And so without risk, without fear of that risk, there is no adventure. So Jay and Lauren began their travels in Cape Town, South Africa in July of 2017. They rode north into the red dust of the Kalahari Desert. They saw baboons with their four inch fangs and a pack mentality and the courage just to take whatever they wanted. They could be really aggressive, but Jay and Lauren were able to sneak past them without any issues. The heat became sweltering in the days and nights were cool. The roads were rough and almost non-existent in parts. But they learned to really relish the evenings. They'd listen to podcasts, they'd make dinner, talk, and reflect on the best and worst parts of the day. So they made it through to Botswana, and they'd often stayed with people that they'd met through the warm showers and couch surfing websites. Botswana was hot, dry, and flat with arid, unforgiving lands. And the roadside was absolutely littered with animal carcasses. In a pretty funny moment, they found themselves inspecting yet another roadside carcass on the side of the road. They'd ride their bikes up and see something dead on the side of the road. And they joked about how apparently inspecting roadside carcasses is now a thing we do. It's probably something they never ever predicted themselves doing before they left on this trip. And they were actually vegetarians. Jay was actually vegan. So seeing dead animals might have been a shock at first, but then they got used to it. And then there were the animals who were alive and very dangerous. In Botswana, people respect and fear the elephant. Locals had warned Jay and Lauren repeatedly not to bush camp where elephants roam and they listened to that advice. But one day they were cycling with another cyclist they met on the road and they came across this large bull elephant across the road. He was about 100 meters or 300 feet ahead of them and just on the other side of the road eating leaves from a tree. The elephants suddenly became aware of their presence and stared at them. And they looked back, really not sure what to do, but they knew that you were not supposed to look wild animals in the eyes, so they kind of averted their eyes. So they began to weigh their options. There was option one, wait for a vehicle to pull up and ask if the driver could kind of escort them by and kind of act as a shield between them and the elephant. Option two was if an oncoming vehicle was coming, they would ride at the same time and kind of time it so it's right beside the elephant while they are, and it's also gonna act as a shield. And option three was just give her, just go for it. 
And while they were weighing their options, all of a sudden a big truck came out of nowhere and started coming down the roads towards them. So because there wasn't a lot of traffic on the road, they thought this is their opportunity. They got to go and they got to go now. So they hit their pedals hard and they raced forward, hoping to meet the truck just as they passed the elephant. But their timing was way off. They'd never done this before. They didn't know how to time passing an elephant on a road. So the truck went by and then they were right there beside the elephant with nothing between them. Jay eyed this massive beast in his periphery as he was going by and it was watching them very intently. It stopped chewing and was just watching as they went by. So they pedaled even faster and just tried not to make eye contact. Then as they got past it, Jay kind of looked back and saw that the elephant was distressed. It was having a fit. It was twisting its head back and forth and flapping its old big old elephant ears and Lauren was to his left and the other cyclist was just ahead. Jay looked back again and then the elephant started moving. Oh crap, he said. And then it started running and charging towards him. It was chasing them. So he just said, go, 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 he's chasing us. They all hammered their pedals as hard and fast as they could and race forward. Jay looked back again to see the elephant still in pursuit and they just kept pedaling and pedaling, hoping that it wouldn't catch them. Finally, about 30 seconds later, or as Jay says, it could have been 10 seconds or a minute. He said time was really non-existent in that moment. He looked back to see the elephant finally slowing down. What a relief. That must have been so terrifying, having a big gigantic elephant chasing you down the road. And then the elephant slowed even more, stopped and turned around and headed back to its tree. So Jay later said that a charging elephant, they can run like 40 kilometers an hour. And with our loaded bikes, we could do 20 at best. So if that elephant really wanted to catch them, it would have easily. So after that exciting day, they traveled through to Zambia. They saw more baboons. They met up with old friends. They saw the famous Victoria Falls, though it was the dry season. It was kind of more of a trickle, but still cool to see nonetheless. Jay ended up getting malaria around this time and needed quite a few days to recover. So luckily they were staying with some hosts at the time. And this is when Jay was able to kind of reflect on their travels so far now that they had some downtime and malaria. He said, cycling across the world is like a poorly attended parade. You move slowly and people occasionally stand on the sidelines to watch and you're always expected to wave. This is a common theme that you hear from other cyclists is that there's always kids or people waving and they kind of feel like the center of attention. And the description of it being like a parade is totally spot on. So Jay kicked the malaria and they were able to get back on the road. And not long after that, he took a header over his handlebars and totally wiped out. He shredded his shirt and he got road rash all over his body. He was relatively okay other than the minor flesh wounds. And Lauren's knee started hurting around this time too, so they actually took some rides from people to get further up the road and just to kind of rest their injuries. And then they ended up bypassing parts of Africa due to political instability. There was rumors of dangerous areas. It was stifling hot, so they just decided to fly to Egypt. It was at that time when Jay said that he realized that the world is a much less scary place now. After traveling on the road for nine months, not having, you know, the language of the local area and all of that, those uncertainties that they went in with were kind of squashed now as they got used to feeling like that and meeting new people and realizing that things were actually okay and a lot of fun. So then they flew to Europe and cycled through Spain, France and Italy and met Lauren's parents who came to visit them. They all spent a couple weeks together and just enjoyed exploring together and connecting with each other. Lauren's mother kind of sensed that her daughter was missing home, so she suggested that maybe she come home at that time. But Jay and Lauren, they'd been through a lot in the last nine months. They had no comforts of home, weeks without showers or a bed. Lauren got pink eye and an ear blockage that sent her to the hospital, and Jay got malaria. And their relationship had also taken a toll due to the strain of just traveling and being together for 24 seven for months on end. But despite all of that, Lauren told her mom that she just wasn't ready for her journey to end. Her mom said that Lauren was so proud of herself for being able to do what she did. So she was gonna continue. Another few weeks went by as they pedaled across the Balkans. And that's when Lauren started to become conflicted about the trip again. She was homesick again. So both Jay and Lauren, they talked about it and decided that once they got to Turkey, they'd reevaluate and decide whether or not to go back to the U.S. So while they were in Eastern Europe, they decided that they had two options to pedal through fast to Central Asia or hop on a plane to Kazakhstan. They wanted to get to the Pamir Mountains and the highway in Tajikistan in warm weather 
Pedaling there now would mean going really fast and missing a lot on the way. And they just didn't like traveling like that. They enjoyed taking their time and meeting people. So they decided to get on the plane. In June, they made it to Kyrgyzstan and the start of the Pamir Highway. When they arrived, that was the time of the busiest season for bike touring in the Pamir Highway. And they experienced the hospitality of the people of Kyrgyzstan really quickly one day when a car went bouncing by them. There wasn't even really a road here. It was just kind of grass and rocks that they were riding on and it was near a river. And they couldn't figure out why there was a car here, what it was doing. But then it stopped and a family got out and they offered them sweet tea and homemade bread. And the cyclists, they were just in awe of this friendliness of the locals. The locals also warned them not to drink from the river and they gave them clean water instead. A young girl then took out a sitar and everyone sat in a circle and listened to her play. They all started singing and it just sounded like one of the most fantastic times they had on their trip. So it's pretty amazing that they were able to sit down and have this moment with each other without even speaking the same language. And then a couple days later they crossed into Tajikistan. Lauren's mother shared her concern that they were going to be cycling close to Afghanistan and that kind of worried her. But Lauren had looked up the U.S. State Department's travel advisory and for Tajikistan it was at a level one, which was exercise normal precautions, the safest possible level. In Tajikistan, they had no history of terrorist attacks targeting Westerners and it wasn't considered a hotbed of extremism. There had been some infrequent attacks in Tajikistan, but mostly targeting government agencies. And so they started cycling the Pamir Highway. And it's probably no surprise to you now to hear that the cycling got really cold, windy, and just all around brutal. And the altitude, that altitude I talked about earlier, it was really starting to affect Lauren. She was actually having a lot of difficulties and the stress of the altitude was causing her panic attacks. And again, this is a time when Lauren started wondering if it was just time to return home and take a break, at least for a while. Friends now say that the couple was actually considering taking a break from the journey after they completed the Pamir Highway. And then they soon met up with Kim and Renee and Marie Claire and Marcus. They'd all kind of bumped into each other several times on the route and they tackled some brutal mountain passes together. They all spent the next 10 days traveling together, getting to know each other and becoming really close friends along the way. As they rested in a park one day, they were interviewed by a local TV station. Tajikistan had been wanting to increase tourism in recent years, and this was a way to promote it. Oh, yes, um, we are seven cyclists who are traveling through Tajikistan. Uh, we met on the road, uh, two Americans, uh, two from Switzerland, two from the Netherlands, and one from France. And we are having a wonderful time in Tajikistan. It's a very beautiful country. Filming, so we okay. Já i moje devožka vlastipěd v Tajikistán i já la blue 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 Tajikistán je to ocean crossy Yes, the people of Tajikistán are very nice. In the video, you can hear the cyclists all kind of joking and laughing in behind, and it just seems like they had a really great evening that night. The gravel roads sometimes is bum 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 on the on the bicycles, but it's very beautiful and. Uh, we've made wonderful friends, good friendship on the road, and we're very happy to, to be in Tajikistan and to be heading toward Dushanbe. Then on the next day, in the early afternoon of July 29th, the group stopped at a gas station to refill their water bottles. While they were there, a car had stopped and a man got out in about his 30s or so and he walked up to Kim and asked what they thought about the country and where they were from. Kim found him to be kind of pushy and Jay responded that he and Lauren were from the US. Nothing else happened from the interaction. The guy went back to his car and the cyclist then left the gas station. They began heading down this quiet stretch of pavement that just look, overlooked this really vast hillside. Jay and Lauren were at the front of the pack of six. According to Kim, all of a sudden, a car raced up behind the group and plowed into them from behind. The force knocked Kim off of her bike and she looked over to see that it had just missed Renee. He was still unharmed at the time. Kim saw that others had also been hit and immediately realized that it was no ordinary accident. 
So she ran across the road trying to stop cars and ask for help, but everyone just kept driving. Then she said, out of the corner of my eye, I saw that the men had gotten out of the vehicle with knives in their hands and started attacking the cyclists on the ground. One of the perpetrators caught sight of Kim and started running towards her, but for some reason before he got there, he turned around and ran back to the car. The car, which was the car of the man they were talking to at the gas station, turned around really quickly and came straight for Kim. Marcus was able to yell to warn her and she jumped out of the way at the last second, but then the car swerved and hit Marcus. Then as quickly as that car appeared, it was gone. People driving by then stopped after the car was gone and they tried to help them as much as they could but Renee, Marcus, Jay, and Lauren all died in the attack. Kim says it all passed by in such a flash and she still can't comprehend what happened. She said, I escaped their attack three times. Renee saved me. It's impossible to understand why someone would do such a thing. After the incident, the attackers drove through a local village and the locals immediately knew that something was wrong due to the state of the car. So they started following them and when the men got out, the locals caught them and held them until police arrived. The attackers then fought police as they arrived and four of the attackers were killed. The fifth was captured and in prison until he died in 2020. So that's the story of Jay, Lauren, Renee, Kim, Marie Claire and Marcus. Six people who were just exploring the world and wanting to experience other cultures, meet new people and just see some beautiful new landscapes. They were all experienced travelers and not naive to the dangers that were out there. They did what they could to mitigate the danger, but you can only do so much. Like Jay said, all it takes is one thing, and he was right about it being an angry person. It was five angry people that day who ended the lives of four people. As Jay said on his blog, relatively speaking, bike touring is really safe, and he's right. There's thousands of cyclists who go traveling all over the world every year, and they come home safely. Jay's sister later explained that their route actually consisted of bypassing many of the problem countries. Now, I don't have a lot of information about Kim and Marie Claire after the incident. Um, Kim did do some interviews, but uh, as far as I could find, Marie Claire didn't really do any. But I did find out that Kim and Renee's book finally did come out after the trip was over. Jay and Lauren's friends talked about their legacy. They said that while we continue to grieve the loss of our friends, we take comfort in the legacy of love, kindness, exploration, and adventure that they left behind. Their friend Ryan said they live their life that they long to see more of in the world, for people to be kinder, more generous, and more adventurous. The world's not as unknowable, scary, or foreign as it might seem. There are people you'd like just waiting to meet you, easily accessible wonders just waiting to surprise you. Indeed, there's magic out there. And I'll leave you with this quote from Jay. I could die doing what I love, but I can also die never really having lived. And that would be a far greater tragedy.